But if ever your mind tickles you and wants to ask of God something, remember, ask for nothing but desirelessness. And that is asking the most from God. Desirelessness. Then he explained what desirelessness mean, meant. Means if you have, if you are full in stomach, say, if you have eaten a very big dinner, so to say, would you have immediate desire to have more food? No. Even if the best of food is spread near you, you won't have. You, have, you won't have desire to have food. So if you now, if you are rolling in riches, if you have the best of cars, the best of everything, would you want to have that same car again, another car? No. You have got all the things. So when do you become desireless? When do you happen to be desireless? When you have everything. So if you ask God for being desire, for having desirelessness, well, you have everything. But when you ask of God for desirelessness, it is not in the sense that you will possess everything, but really ask for desirelessness so that the very fact, the boon that is bestowed upon you of desirelessness does not give you any craving or any wants or any needs for anything. You are above your needs, above your wants, let alone your desires. They are no more there. So that's how one day Baba, in his pleasant moods, you see, called upon us to ask him for a boon. And we asked. Well, I don't know of those who have asked for God realization whether they have got God realization or they might get, who knows? Or they are already God realized and yet they don't know. It would seem to me if you were God realized, you'd know it. But I must tell you, in our family, that is my parents, my brother, my sisters, all of them never craved for God or God realization or to become saints or any, any yogis or having any powers or anything. All what we wanted, if at all we wanted anything was to be with him, just to be with him, that's all. Not to gape at him, not to gaze at him or adore his face or anything of that sort, but to be handy. So that if anything Baba needed, any, any work is to be done, then we were there as slaves, so to say, by his side. That's all. And time and again my mother would say that if ever Baba would condescend to bestow any gift or boon, allow her to come again and again whenever he happens to come on this earth. And that's my feeling too. Did, uh, can you remember any time when Baba tested you in any way, such as your patience or oh, yes. any such test? Oh, he was a great teaser. Baba, uh, you ask me whether Baba was t testing anybody. I don't think that he tested anybody, but he was a great teaser. He used to you. tease us. Oh, tease the Mandli. He would, he would simply say, you see, well, suppose if I am not in the hall near Baba, you see, I am busy somewhere else. So he would tell Baidul or Kaka or somebody, look here, why is it that Erech behaves in such a such a manner you see with you? What, is, what have you done to him? He says, well, I don't know. I haven't done anything to him, you see, but he just behaves like that. You know what happened? Human tendency is that to pick up at any straw that is given to them. So, well, he says, well, I haven't behaved anything to you. He, be, he behaves like that. Then as soon as I enter the hall, he says, Baba would say that, look what Bhaidur wants to say, you see. Has he told you anything about it? He says, you behave in a way that irritates him. Then I flare up and he flares up and then Baba has a great joke, you see, and enjoys. And then he becomes the peacemaker, you see. And then he enjoins upon us to embrace each other and forget about the things. And then he would have a good laugh, you see. So that's how he would sometimes, very rarely, would just have a very uh, light mood or an atmosphere in his presence. But it would be surcharged with great excitement, you see. Each one would roar out, you see, his feelings in his presence. 
But then, later on, we came to know that he enjoys this little pleasure. So we would put a show, put up a show, you see, and just fight like anything, you see. Oh, and you argue a little, oh, yes, you and the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we would just do that, you see. And especially with Gustaji, Baidun, Kaka, myself, Kekobad sometimes, you see, Pendu. And we would have great fun, you see, knowing fully well that it's just a put-up show, you see, that's all. Did. And one day it so happened, the excitement was so great that Baidul started roaring with his, you know, false teeth, you know. So he started shouting to such an extent that the upper denture fell on the ground. So he at once picked it up, shouted inside, you see, and started shouting again. And that was some fun for Baba, you see. And you should see, and that was uh, a ray, uh, sort of a quarrel between Kaka and Baidul. Oh, it was fun to see that, you see. Something. Mm. But the thing now, and all, yeah. it all happened, you see, that Baba again started teasing because Baidul had brought a certain must who was passing loose tools, you see, and Kaka was in charge of supplying the material, you see, a carpet for them. So every time the must would pass a stool, Baidul would change the thing and put a new carpet there. And Kaka got fed up with this and he started shouting, you see. So when ha what happened was that just at that time, Baba happened to go nearby and said, what's the matter? He said, ba Kaka complained that this is the matter, you see, that this man has no sense, you see, instead of trying to clean that carpet and have the same carpet because this man is passing stool every few minutes. And do you mean to say that I am supposed to wash all the, all the carpets every few minutes? There? It's a heavy thing, it won't dry, and when will we supply them? Baba told Baidul, he says, Baidul, you should realize these things, why you do that? So then he gave the reasons that it's you who have enjoined me to see to his comfort. That's what Baidul told Baba. And Kaka is obstructing in the way that I am doing it. So Kaka flared up, you see, and said that you have no common sense. And Baidul said that you have no obedience. And likewise, you see, he started shouting at Kaka. And just at that time, the dentures fell. And then he picked the dentures up, put them in the mouth again and started shouting. So that was a very funny sight, you see. And Baba enjoyed it to his heart's content. We all were there. We also enjoyed at the cost of Kaka and Baidul getting excited. So while Baba was in infinite knowledge, power, and bliss, he was the perfect man, yes. enjoying the, the jobs oh, yes. to his oh, heart. Yes. Oh, yes. He was enjoying. He brought out these situations, you see. He brought, he brought about such circumstances that brought out our nature in his presence. Most probably he wanted us to change, you see. And the deep-rooted feelings for anybody, you see, were brought out to the surface and just thrown out. That's how he worked, most probably with our deeper feelings. What else now you want to ask me? <laughs> yes, when you say that you feel Baba's presence, what do you mean by, by your, the presence you feel of Baba? What, we, what I mean by feeling his presence is that now, this moment, what are we doing? We are talking about Baba's things. We are bringing back all the actions that had happened in his presence. So, actually, we are not only bringing his presence here, but we are enacting the same drama in his presence. So, that's how day in and day out, I have been marking that since he has dropped his body, his presence has become the question of the day, you see. Whether we feel his presence or not, and we say that we feel his presence more, more so after he has dropped his body. Because when he was in body, we used to take it for granted that he is there. We felt that he was eternal. He would not drop his body or anything. We never even gave a, gave a thought to his body. What we felt was that Baba is, was and will ever be. At present, we miss his body, but at the same time, we don't miss him. You miss the companionship. We miss not companionship. What? The thing is that we, we, I at least especially miss his silence more than anything else. <laughs> Because I was associated with the silence. Otherwise, Baba is there. Baba's 
episodes are there the whole atmosphere is live with his presence he walked here he sat here he was this he was that but there is no such thing as that baba wants you all baba calls you all baba wants to do this baba summons you so those ringing voices you see of his silence are no no longer heard otherwise everything is just the same you see we talk of baba we used to talk of baba when baba's body was there baba used to be present in our before our eyes we can't see him but we feel the atmosphere we feel that what, what were some of the things that that you or the monthly would do that would suddenly make baba burst out in laughter well our our expressions of weakness that would make him burst out in laughter you see just as now i i gave that incident between kaka and baidul likewise there are other incidents you see for instance it so happened i don't know whether adi has narrated this incident or not adi bought a new car you see and he was very happy about it and he craved to have baba seated for the first time in that new car so that he could drive baba out so it so happened did he narrate this incident yeah so what happened he was in pune at the time and baba expressed his wish that he would want to go and see a cricket match you know baba was fond of match seeing matches so well it was good adi was very happy about it but then all of a sudden you see baba expressed his wish that he would like babji to be taken with him for seeing the cricket match you know the must alisha yes uh, so the perfect ma- person in baba wanted a perfect companion alisha to see a match this <laughs> cricket match is something fantastic you see to take your must there to witness a cricket match naturally when alisha was in pune instead of baidul baidul was sent out gusta ji was made in charge of alisha's comforts so it so happened that alisha gusta ji adi baba and one or two of us went in that new car of adi you see and we parked the car on the main road in pune you see just where the stadium is naturally baba wouldn't go inside the pavilion to sit there he just watched the matches from the road side all of a sudden you see while baba was seated in the car alisha wanted to get out of the car so gusta ji opened the door and alisha got out of the car and very calmly as if there was no presence of anybody you see right on the main road in the posh locality of pune city mind you he just puts up his shirt you see he has no trousers or anything of the sort and then he passes his stool there right on the road side you see and adi is so much worried about the whole situation you see and gusta ji as if nothing has happened you see he has pieces of paper in his pocket you see knowing fully well the circumstances in which he would be put to gusta ji was a very practical person you see so he carried piece of paper in his pocket one piece after the other you see he would just clean the spot and another blotch there and another cleaning and another and all and the sight of adi made baba burst out in laughter you see the whole situation was so funny you see right on the main road this must having disregard for anybody in the world <laughs> passing a stool there <laughs> baba right there by the side of the pavilion trying to see the cricket match adi with his brand new car feeling happy that baba is seated in that and gusta ji as if nothing has happened is just clearing his parts you see so such situations you see made baba burst out into laughter but being in silence his laughter couldn't be heard all whole body would be vibrating and he would become red as a rose you see in face how would he look when he laughed red as a rose and just full in face can you no he would turn red you see pink was his original color pink was pink was his original color yes but he would turn red you see could you imitate especially here can you imitate on, on his chest how, also can you imitate how baba would laugh well yes if i if i can i would try to so well if there is any funny situation he would start laughing you see so first Ha 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 ha.
Mm-hmm. 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 You were, did Baba give any hints? Did Baba give any hints about the dropping of his body before he dropped his body? Well, I don't think so that he gave any hints about these things. But he used to say something about his personal tragedy, you see. That very soon there will come a time when we will come to know of a very serious personal tragedy, you see. And even Francis dilated upon it, how could there be a personal tragedy or something like that? Well, that was long before he dropped his body, say a month or two months before that, you see. And uh, will this appear in the screen? I don't know. What was you, there's an ant here, you see. Oh, I... Yeah. yeah would, uh, when an ant crawled on Baba... Where? Yes, he, he would take particular care, you see, that the ant is not destroyed. Is that so he'll just yes, brush it off very gently, you see. And sometimes we'd be walking, you see, fast with Baba. So at once he'll catch hold of our hand and stop us. Says there are ants there. See that you don't crush them. You just see, watch them that they were not crushed under his feet and he would also halt all of a sudden, hold our hands and draw our attention that there are ants and we should be very careful that we don't crush them. Because once Baba said that if ants are crushed and meet so-called unnatural death at the, at the hands of human beings, they uh, get birth as ants once again. Unless and until they have their natural death, they have no further evolution. So snakes are to be killed and ants are to be saved. That's what Baba said. Why uh, would snakes be killed? I don't know. You should, uh, you should ask Baba now in his next <laughs> event. But, uh... Uh, if Baba, did Baba tell you snakes should be killed? Yes, snakes must be killed, Baba said. But ants must be saved. It would help them in their evolution yes, yeah, if they were killed? Yeah. yeah. If, they are, if snakes are killed, it will help them in their evolution. If ants are killed, it will harm them in their evolution. You were present when Baba dropped his body. You were in the room at the time? Yes, I was in the room at the time when Baba dropped his body. I was by his side, by his bedside. Could you tell us the events of that day and... Oh my, to tell you the events of the day, how should I narrate that? You should read that book, you see, called The Last Sahavas, written by Dr. Hoshang Parucha. You know. He is depicting in that the last moments. We like your personal account. <laughs> <laughs> well, the personal account is this, that for about two or three days, if I remember right, because I don't know. Except Baba's body, we had no other recollections or no other thought, you see. And we were wit- witnesses to his intense suffering, you see. Not the suffering of a person who is, so to say, ill or a- ailing. It was some peculiar suffering. The, the, uh, the atmosphere itself, so to say, was surcharged with a sort of terrible suffering. There. In the midst of Baba's usual jovial nature. At about, Baba dropped his body near about 12.15 midday. Was he being given medicines at the time? Yes, it so happened (laughs) that uh, uh, Padri, you see, had brought some homeopathy pills for Baba. Being a mandali, he had every right to administer some sort of medicine for Baba's body, you see, the Godman's body. And uh, so he had started giving those, I think, uh, uh, since morning, you see, of that day, 31st of January. And uh, Padri had assured Baba, the God-man, that a couple of or three doses, you see, uh, taken every two hours would <laughs> alleviate the suffering, you see. So at 12 o'clock, mind you, 12.15, Baba dropped his body. At 12 o'clock, Padri is by his side and Baba jokes with him and says, what sort of homeopathy is this, you see, your medicine? You should throw the whole box out of your room, he said. What has it done to me? It has not stopped the ailment. 
the jerks are there, you see the spasm that you used to get, they are there. So what sort of homeopathy medicine you are giving? You are sure that it will be all right, you see, within two or three doses. So better throw the thing out, you see. It doesn't, and that he didn't say it through disgust or anything, but in his usual jocular way, he pronounced his judgment that it's useless. Yes, I was there when he breathed his last. He was reclining on that bed, you see, called the surgical bed. And uh, at about, near about 12.15, maybe 12.12, 12, he, but the whole body got a sort of a terrible, uh, went into spasm, you see. And we felt as if the body was just lifted out from the bed. And there, that was the last thing, you see. That was the end of it. That's all. What was your immediate reaction? My immediate reaction was that I should start uh, start the respiration as soon as possible. And I did not know any other method, but I just put two fingers in his mouth, you see, and tried to bring, uh, tried to just open the thing and started breathing and mouth to mouth breathing. You see. And then I did that for about, I don't know how long, till I fainted and fell down from the bed. And then when I got up, I found Dr. Donkin, Dr. Ginde, Dr. Brisbane, Dr. Gaber were attending. I don't know what they were trying to do, but some injections were given or some sort of massage to his heart and chest was there. And then I went, walked out, uh, away from Baba's body and sat on a chair by the side. That is the end of it. But the doctors pronounced that the body has been dropped by the God-man. When Baba, sometimes Baba would refer to you know, the suffering that was very great. And uh, could you give a, sort of like an idea of, of the suffering that Baba went through uh, just uh, in the years that, that you've known him? That you see, you I know, can uh, give, you asked me to give you an idea of Baba's intense suffering. But how can I give you any idea of any intense suffering of Baba, you see, which he suffered? The only thing that I can be a witness to is, an, is the atmosphere that pervaded at the time. You see, when Baba, you know, in Baba's presence, there are so many witnesses who have said that they came with a tortured mind or an ache in their heart, or they were so much troubled that as soon as they entered in Baba's room and were in his presence, they felt at peace with them, within them and with, with the world. They felt that calm, that they felt that, that peace. They felt that soothing balm that they craved for, you see, for their aching bones as persons crave for some sort of balm or massage. So they, for their aching heart, they felt that soothing atmosphere was very, uh, very much pleasant to them. So these experiences were with us. Whenever we were in Baba's presence, you see, we had no idea of the worldly worries or the worries that we had or anything of the sort. But we could testify to his suffering only when we felt ourselves somewhat in an atmosphere that was surcharged with suffering. So at that time, we could feel that he, his body must be suffering. From his facial expressions, he just remained. There were no wrinkles on his forehead or anything, just as a man suffers, you see. Now you see me in the picture, you might find me as if I look very tired or exhausted or anything. I've seen there in the picture there, in that television screen of yours, I find myself, I'm amazed to see myself so exhausted there in that picture. <laughs> so, such sort of experience we never had from Baba's physiognomy. He looked as if there was nothing wrong with him. But the atmosphere around him became so surcharged with the agony that he must be passing through that we felt we were affected by that atmosphere. We felt sad. We felt pressed down, pinned down, so to say, with something which we did not know. That's how we felt that he was suffering. And just at that time, he would say, he would testify that he was suffering intensely. That's all. That is the only uh, clue that we had of his suffering. 
Of course, physically we could find sometimes you see a hand giving a jerk like this, you see, or the body would jump, you see, from the bed like that. All of a sudden there would be a sort of a spasm, you see, and all of a sudden there would be cramps, so to say, and he, Baba would point out to his toes or little toe or big toe that, the, that it was in cram, just press it, press it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we would just do that. that. That's just physical experiences that we could have. Nothing more than that, but his facial, his facial expression never revealed any suffering. And yet all the time Baba would be in uh, that infinite bliss of his Godhood, would be behind that? Were you? Baba said about his infinite bliss that if ever God man exercised his infinite infinite bliss. He would never uh, bliss. He would never suffer. So the God man keeps his infinite infinite bliss. You see, in reserve in the background, and experiences it only when he drops the body. It is there. The support is there. No doubt about it. But he, when he becomes man, when God becomes man and mingles in with mankind as man. He never touches the storehouse of his infinite bliss. Otherwise, how would he suffer? He takes the human form in order to suffer. Did you ever ask in order to why he suffered, why he puts, uh, why, why he uh, uh, is in the suffering, why he allows such suffering upon himself? Yes. He, he, we never asked anything of the sort, but he himself gave us the explanation to it. He says that he takes human form. For what reason should he take human form? God is omnipotent all-powerful, omniscient, wherever his abode be, whether right in the heavens above or right under us, you see, or within us or anywhere it be, in any direction, if at all, God can be given any direction, because his omnipresence never allows any direction. So if he is omnipresent, if he is omnipotent, if he is omniscient, what need is for God to be with man as man? What need is it that he should descend from his godhood to become man? Why? What need is there? So Baba put that question and answers to. He says, God becomes man so that God makes his love more tangible to mankind. God makes his compassion felt more tangibly to mankind. God mingles with man as man so that man can realize his being in their midst, however indirectly it be, yet his physical presence gives a feeling in whole humanity of something divine, great, something pleasant. It's inadvertently felt by human beings. But then what do we find? That whenever he is on earth, you find dissensions, you find wars, you find murders. Everything is there. There is no change there. When God man comes to earth, he doesn't make earth a paradise. No. What he does is, he, his presence as man amongst men makes man aware of the presence of God. And therefore, what we find, history, spiritual history repeats, you see, whenever his advents take place, there are always dissensions among mankind, you see. There are always wars. There are always atrocities perpetrated to its height, you see. And you find him there at the time. Through these things, mankind realize or recall his presence, you see. Although he is there at the time, you see. But then they say, oh God, help us. Oh God, where you are? Where are you? Have you forsaken us? And just at that time, he mingles with mankind, without man knowing who is his neighbor there. Without man knowing that God is God is there, his 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 own neighbor there. Yes. Except for just but the then few. what happens? Yes. Then what, except for the few to whom he reveals that that too only because he has the pleasure to reveal his presence. Otherwise, we wouldn't know it. But he comes there, still really he comes among men to make his love felt more tangibly. And that's how mankind starts clamoring for God. You say, oh God, where are you? When will you help us? Have you forsaken us? Don't you realize our difficulties? We are full of worries. 
Please elevate our worries and so forth and so on. There are prayer houses created. Men go more to the churches. Men want more peace, you see, in the midst of wars, mind you. Situations like wars and atrocities do crop up when the advent take place, takes place. Why? Because all the more the, such situations remind mankind of God, His existence. Just as in the time of Jesus and Buddha and Krishna and all of the yes. past advents of the Avatar. Yes, yes. In the, all in the past advents, Did the Baba ever relate uh, anything uh, to you regarding his past avataric advent on the earth? <laughs> well, uh, sometimes you see, when, uh, when uh, Baba spoke of Jesus, he would reveal uh, of his past advent as Jesus the Christ, you see, and said that how meek he was how loving he was, and yet he was crucified, you see. How much he was tortured, put to torture. He did so much good, meaning thereby that he came there full of love for man, and man's hatred, animosity, crucified him. But then there is one more incident that, remind, that your question reminds me of. One day, all of a sudden, you see, he started describing the weakness, his past, his weaknesses in the past events. Have you heard of that before? I had heard of it yeah. once before, but uh, go ahead. Uh, you would like it. to hear of it. it? Well, one day he starts enumerating. You were there then. Yes, I was yeah. there, of course. <laughs> so he started enumerating. You see that he said, when I was Zoroaster, it so happened that while I was in the act of prayers, someone came and gave me the stab in the back. At that time, I just threw the rosary at him, it is said so, and the person died on the spot. That was my weakness. At the time of Ram, it so happened that I forsook Sita, because the laundry man, you see, started spreading rumors that Sita had betrayed Ram. I shouldn't have done that, he said. Then, at the time of Lord Krishna, in order to pacify Arjun, his right-hand man, you see, he showed him his universal form, you see. Arjun was considered to be the most strong-willed person living on earth at the time. And he could not take in the words of uh, Lord Krishna that you find in Gita, you see, that there is nobody who dies, that nobody is who, who is born, everything is just in him and so forth, everybody are in him, there is no relative, no mother, no father, no kith or no kin. So, Arjun couldn't gulp these things, so he had to give Arjun an experience of his universal form, where Arjun got so awestruck with the form, but everything seemed to be, it was like a huge mill, you see, wherein everything was just crushed in him and was spitted out of him. So that was his universal form. He said that he, that was one of his weaknesses during one of the advents. To reveal, to his, reveal his universal form to, Ra, uh, to Arjun. Well, then we come to, from uh, Lord Krishna, we come to now say Buddha. Buddha. What happened there? Says I ought to have revealed to mankind that there are stages after the Nirvana. I took the consciousness of man to that level at the time where Nirvana, once attained, is the goal. That was my and weakness. Then, but he should have. He should have revealed further. He said. He didn't say that, but he says that was my weakness in at the time when I was Buddha, that I revealed to mankind as far as Nirvana and not further than that. Then he says, at the time of Jesus, when I was crucified, I have been recorded as saying, O oh Father, O oh Father, why hast thou forsaken me? I ought not to have done that. That's my weakness, he said. 
Then at the time of Muhammad, you see, Baba said, when I was Muhammad in that advent, my weakness was that I did not reveal to mankind that I was God in human form. I simply told, I revealed myself as the messenger of God. Then naturally after Muhammad was the advent, this advent of Avatar Mehr Baba. So we expected something about this advent. So in a very humorous manner, Baba dismissed the weakness of this advent saying that when I come back after 700 years, I will reveal to you all weakness of Avatar Mehr Baba in my next advent. <laughs> so those are the weaknesses of his past advents, as he called them. Anything more? Baba's manifestation this time, I understand, is to be uh, the combination or the consolidation of all of the advents from before. Yes, he said about his manifestation that his manifestation will be the greatest this time. Had he uh, said any things regarding his manifestation to you uh, as to how it would surpass the uh, past advents of his on the earth? First of all, he has said just this much, as far as I re recall now, that his manifestation will be the greatest, greatest of all the past advents. But then, if we go into the details of what manifestation actually means, well, there are several explanations coming forth from several different quarters. What was Baba's explanation? Baba's own explanation was nothing of the sort, you see. It's all conjectures from those who were with Baba and those who have not even seen Baba, you see, and who have only heard his words. Manifestation means worldwide recognition. Just as we say now, we talk about Jesus the Christ, you see. We need not go into details that he was the son of God, as he called himself, that he and his father were one, are one, that I am the one that was expected, and so forth. We know Jesus the Christ means we know that it was one of his past advents. Wherever you go in the world, you find that, you see. But as Vivekananda once said, that we know in India of Jesus the Christ much more than those who know in the West, you see. So likewise, Baba had said that his manifestation would be the greatest meaning thereby, that there won't be, a time will come when there won't be a spot in the world where humanity will not know of him. That will be uh, the greatest manifestation, you see. His manifestation, that means there are some people who visualize that he will come from the clouds that there will be a huge bright light, you see, pouring out of the skies, you see, and reminding us of Baba's manifestation. And there Baba will appear in all his glory and all that sort of thing. Well, I don't say that they don't interpret Baba's manifestation rightly, but at the same time, I must say with certain reservations about this sort of manifestation of Baba, you see. Baba will reveal himself in individual hearts as well as to the world of his divinity. And when the world recognizes his advent, which we now call in terms of his past advent, because he has dropped his body, that will be the day of his manifestation. It won't be one day, it will be gradually coming, dawning upon mankind of his advent. And a day will arrive when the whole world will know of him. And that will be his greatest manifestation. That's how I feel it, mind you, sir. That doesn't mean that Eris speaks directly from what Baba has said. That's how I conjecture on this particular theme. That's all. That's my conjecture. When there's a question in the West, at least in America, which, have, which has been asked a number of times by 
many people. And it's um, about the inner circle of Baba. Do, uh, is the Mandali the inner circle, or do the Mandali know who the inner circle is composed of, of Baba's 12 most intimate disciples? This well, Arvind, your question about your circle of Baba, you have not selected the right person to answer this question. Because, I will tell you why I say this. Because when I first joined Baba to live with him, when Baba ordered me to leave all and follow me, follow him, it was in the year 1938, on 1st of August, I came to Baba to live with him. At that time, it so happened that the atmosphere in Mehrabad was surcharged with the talk of circles. <laughs> the inner circle, the outer circle, the twelve circles, or the ten circles of the avatar, and so forth. I was just a novice who was in the midst of the old timers, sitting and quietly listening to these talks. You see. And I was a student in engineering, and I had to deal much with geometry and trigonometry. And I was wonderstruck as to why these spiritual-minded people talk in terms of circles, you see. And it so happened that soon after this, one day Baba asked me, what is the talk that you hear in Mehrabad when I am not with you? He said, well, there are talks you see on different subjects and all that. But there is one talk that has intrigued me, and that is the talk that is going around about something to do with circles, which I know nothing of. So he said, he stopped. We were climbing the hill, you see. My duty was to bring Baba down the hill, holding the umbrella over him, and to take him back at the appropriate time, you see, when he wanted to go back holding the umbrella on his head, you see, to protect him from the sun, direct rays of the sun. So there he halted on the way and said, pointing to the ears, says, look, Eraj, he said, through his alphabet board and gestures, he says, whatever you heard of, you have heard of circles, hear it, or you hear in future, hear it with one ear and let it pass through the second ear. So that's why I say, Irvin, that you have chosen a wrong person to answer your query regarding circles. Well, I felt if anyone should know, you have lived with Baba long enough to hear his reply. Well, to that, of course, I must refer to you, uh, you about his having given a talk, at quite a lengthy talk on circles, you see, and, it, and the article has appeared in the, uh, issue, one of the issues of the Awakener, you see. And that will give you some idea of what he meant by circles and all that, you see. There isn't anything you could add to that? No. Mm. Okay. Living uh, in Meherazad uh, with Baba, how, um, how, how did like, you get your food? Um, did, you, did you eat well every day? Uh, y your clothing, uh, did you go to the market to buy your clothing? Uh, how did you come by uh, all these things? Food, clothing, the, your necessities? Well, our stay with Baba in Mehrazad or wherever we were, you see, was a stay. We cannot call it as living with the God-man. It was a day-to-day -day stay or day-to-day -day living, you see. For food, Baba provided us with food. The food was so simple that once Harry Kenmore remarked, you see, when Harry, Dr. Harry Kenmore came to our place at Mehrazad, First, he says, Eraj, what did you have for your lunch today? I said, dal and rice. The next day he asked me, what did you have for lunch today? I said, dal and rice. The third day, dal and rice. So he said, now let us square this thing up. He said, when I ask you on a certain day, see, what did you eat? You should reply, dal and rice. And on the next day, you should reply, rice and dal. So that will give a variety, you see. So our food was really very simple. 
Sometimes Baba would spread a feast for the mandali because some outsider or the close ones who would come from Bombay or Pune or from any distant place, they would bring some sweets or some food, cooked food for us. So it was a day of feast for us. Baba never starved us for a single day unless and until he asked us to have, hold, have fasts, days of fasts, when we never touched water or food. That was quite different. But during my stay with Baba, never once have I ever experienced that we had to starve. We had our fill. We used to eat a lot because we were young and we could digest well. Those who were old and could not digest, they ate according to their appetite. But I remember having, uh, having eaten good quantity of food. Baba never kept any, uh, what do you call, gave any restrictions on the consumption of food. But the food was very simple. Same thing with the clothing, you see. Well, we would just be clothed to protect our bodies. Not in suits or uh, special dress or anything of the sort. But then at the same time, Baba never kept us naked, you see. Everything was within limits and whatever Baba offered us, it was something very great to us. Even a stale bread offered by Baba would be as rich as a piece of cake to us. Just as a, a t-shirt offered by Baba to protect our body would be like a dress to us. And usually the clothes came from the clothes ones who offered them to be distributed by Baba's own hands and he would distribute them to us. Handkerchiefs, socks or woolies, all these things were given by Baba people to be distributed to the mandali. Even now, what I am wearing and having these things are nothing but things that have been given to us by others. You see, the shoes belong to my father. This shirt was left behind by one of the Westerners when he came in 1969. Yeah. See, this one. These the pair of trousers that I'm wearing, somebody offered this, this piece of cloth, you see, for me to make a pair of trousers, you see. So it's like that. Sometimes, Baba uh, seemed to lay stress sometimes on not hurting the feelings of other people. Could, could you, uh, like, open that up a little bit more to get a little bit more yeah. insight into that? The, yeah, that's a very good question, you see. Baba had said, that the secret of spirituality is never to hurt the heart of anybody. That means never hurt anybody's feelings. Never to hurt the heart because heart is his abode. If you hurt the heart, you hurt him where he resides. But then he created one exception to it, that you shouldn't go to the extent of pleasing anybody's sexual appetite. That was a taboo. You go to any extent, at the cost of your happiness, you try to give relief to people, to not hurt the feelings, but not to the extent of acquiescing in the requests for any sexual intercourse or sexual habits. That, he said, will drive you away from the path of spirituality. Did Baba ever uh, point out to you when perhaps you had been harsh to, to someone uh, at that point, at that time, how not to, to hurt the feelings of that yeah. individual. Yes, it's a good uh, reminder. Uh, many occasions came, you see, and especially during the darshan hours or darshan days when there would be crowds, you see, and uh, we were under great strain, you see, to make arrangements and all that. It was not very practical for me, especially, to not hurt the feelings of the others, you see. Sometimes I would just express my feelings in a way that would hurt the feelings of others, you see. So, and if at all that had happened in presence of Baba, at once Baba would stop me, admonish me, and I still remember several occasions when Baba asked me to bow down to that person whose heart was hurt because of my harsh words. I remember uh, Baba spoke to you one time about detachment. There, there was a man that wanted to take a, 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 a picture of you with his camera, and, and at that time you didn't feel that, uh, that he should be taking a picture uh, of you, Edith. It was not important. Yeah. 
And do you recall that incident? Uh, yeah, I recall that incident about exercising my detachment, you see. <laughs> but it was just a phony detachment as Baba pointed out to me. So, there was an incident, you see, when a, a certain person who had come for Baba's darshan, he took a fancy to me and thought that I was with Baba for so many years and I was the interpreter of Baba's gestures and somehow or other, you see, he, to him, I was some sort of a personality. And I detested this sort of concept or understanding in anybody. And naturally he tried to take a picture of me and I avoided that. And there was a lot of argument over this subject, you see, outside Baba's room. Baba overheard the sort of argument and clapped his hand. That was a signal that I should go and see him. So I went inside and Baba asked me as to what was happening. Why was the argument taking place? I said, somebody wants to have a picture of me. Baba said, what, what is it that uh, stops you from uh, making another person happy? You see, if he wants to take a picture, why not? I said, I don't like anybody taking pictures, you see. What they... S there is a sort of a uh, misunderstanding, you see. If they want just a picture, that's a different thing. But what they say is that because I'm an interpreter of Baba, because I'm somebody great, they want a picture of mine. Baba says, it doesn't matter. What harm is there? If you don't take cognizance of this fact and if you just simply stand there, uh, what do you call, in answer to his request, and if you don't take cognizance of what he says, what harm is there? No sooner you take cognizance, you are caught, you are trapped in those impression, with those impressions. But if you don't take cognizance, you just give in answer to his, give in to, the, uh, give in to his request, it doesn't matter. What harm is there if you, if you allow yourself to be snapped? So from that date, it so happened, you see, some, the way he, Baba, I cannot reproduce the actual sentences that Baba told me, but I still remind, uh, remember that from that day, nothing stops me in, uh, to condescend or you may call it to agree to the wishes or requests of people who want to take pictures or anything of the sort. Knowing fully well that if ever I were to take cognizance of it, I am trapped of it. But if they just request, I just stand there and finish. The subject is off and over. This reminds me of a very beautiful story that I had once read. And the story is like this. There were two Zen monks, you see, Zen Buddhists. One day, it was a rainy day when they were returning home from their walks, one of their walks. And they, there was a lot of water on the road, you see. Those days were not the days, you see, where we had these roads built, you see, specially for uh, heavy traffic or anything of the sort. There were a lot of potholes and ditches and you may call ponds on the way, you see. So it so happened that there was a young lady who didn't feel like crossing that stretch of water over that road that was there. So one of the monks lifted the girl and crossed that stretch and put her back there on the road. The other monk, you see, who saw this was shocked. A monk having touched a woman and lifted her. So, well, he kept quiet over this incident. When the other monk saw the monk having carried the woman, you see, and put her by on the road, he was so shocked, you see, that he observed silence. And both the monks walked up to the monasteries in complete silence, speaking no words. When, the, when they reached the monastery, it so happened that the monk who had witnessed the scene admonished the other monk, saying, how dare you touch that woman and carried her? He says, what do you speak of? Says, I just left her at the end of the ditch. And you still carry her to the monastery? So that's how our mind plays tricks, you see. The man who had not committed the act seemed to have trapped, got trapped in the impressions, whereas the person 
who had actually lifted the girl and carried her seemed to have just left her at the place and forgot about it completely so that's how our mind played tricks any more questions yes there was another question did you ever reach a point with bob where you got <laughs> frustrated and and then you got angry mad at him well, <laughs> i i have one incident to tell you and that was of because of complete exhaustion you see baba would send me on errands sometimes on foot sometimes in bullock carts in tongas and mostly on bicycle and for miles together you see and no sooner i completed the errand and returned to baba and report there would be another one ready for me and he would send me out so day in and day out day after day weeks after weeks months after months years after years thus was too much it was telling upon my health and i used to feel very exhausted one day he sent me out on an errand for about 12 miles on bicycle not just one errand in a day it was i think the fourth one that was i was executing and on my return i got so fed up and exhausted i my mind started playing a trick you see he said that hey raj if you were to return immediately after this errand the result is that you will be sent back for something else and your body now can no longer stand so it revolted the body and mind revolted and there was a culvert there you see it was a culvert we call you see there was a road side uh, on the road there is a small, tiny bridge like thing you see for water to pass underneath the road and you build those we call them culverts you see, see. there are two little parapets built you see so i spotted one it was a broad one i said best is that you sleep here and instead of reporting to baba halfway i must have returned halfway about say 6 miles or so and i thought it best to relax and go to sleep so i tied the cycle to my wrist you see the wheels and i just went to sleep dared to do that you see for the first time and i think it was for the last time too and then when i returned baba asked me as to how many miles you had to go i said 12 miles how many miles you had to return i said 12 miles 24 miles and you took nearly 4 hours what was the delay why were you why were you so late in returning well, i said i was rather tired and i had to relax a bit you see oh where did you relax he asked me oh, on a culvert i slept oh you did go to sleep he said yeah well it's good body needs rest but remember henceforth it is better to come and come back home and rest instead of lying there on the culvert there with a bicycle someone might pinch the bicycle you see and you'll be deprived of that and you'll have to walk the distance so i had to be very careful to see that the cycle was intact for you to return you see after your rest that's how he just brushed aside that episode lightly you see admonishing me to be very uh, in his admonishment admonishing me he warned me also not to repeat the incident once again so that's how yes he used to keep us engaged you see all day and we were not free in the nights too we had to keep watch near baba keep awake not the whole night but a portion of the night you see when we would like to rest and sleep undisturbed there would be frequent calls even after our watch hours are over and he would call us summon us and would just say remember this point for the morning that's all and go back we go back and go to sleep there was never a problem with not going to sleep you see we would go to sleep at an instant you see and wake up at the instant that we were summoned we didn't have any sleeping pills or we didn't have any plugs in our ears for any noise nothing was there to disturb us nothing was there to break our sleep you see we could go to sound sleep state in an instant 
and wake up no sooner Baba summoned us. But there were instances when we used to, when the body used to rebel against exhaustion, that's all. Is there a, ever a time where you told Baba a lie? And uh, yeah, was there ever such a time? Well, I don't, I cannot recall any... Something instance. that you told him that was untrue. 